Hello and welcome to beautiful Fodnum here in the heart of gorgeous uh, Herefordshire. And we're here on our third Amash meeting. This is our first one of 2012. And we have this wonderful group of experiences, researchers and therapists here. And we're going to just start with a, a hello and welcome everybody introducing themselves. And if we can start with Ray, please. Thank yeah. you. You're uh, the reason that we're here. And we have to thank uh, Guy and Linda Taylor and their events manager, Ray. OK, I'm Ray Moore. Uh, Guy Taylor is a good friend of mine and he's given over the manor to turn it into an event centre, events of any, any sort and anyone that wants to use the place as an event centre. I am an experiencer and if I get drunk later I might tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll pass it on to Tony because he also does a lot of the donkey work around here. Hi, my name's uh, Tony. Um, I'm uh, looking after some of the, uh, the happenings at the manor and um, trying to organise some of the events that we're putting on here. I've recently written a book called uh, Co uh, Blueprints of Cosmic Consciousness. In that book you, you can like, join me on the journey of how things started to formulate for me to finding out some of the aspects of truth. That's what I'm here to help do. And you're an experiencer, Tony, is that right? Indeed, I've had several experiences with so-called unidentified flying objects on different occasions. You could say I am. Okay, lovely. Well, we'll, we'll just introduce some people at the moment. Susie, 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 Susie Eubank. Thank you. I'm Susie Eubank. I'm a therapist. I'm not an experiencer. Well, not consciously, anyway. <laughs> uh, this is the first Amash meeting I've attended, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Well, I do therapeutic remedial massage. I'm a sports therapist, a Reiki practitioner. I do body talk. I do EFT, emotional freedom technique, which I feel would be extremely advantageous for anyone who needs help in this field and animal communication. Hello, my name is Maria. This is my first Amash meeting. Uh, I came here to meet people that are like me. Uh, I am also an experiencer. I'm not abductee. I would say more like contactee. So I would like to uh, show to other people that there are also good aliens. We'll hear more of your experience uh, during the day. Hello, my name is Joseph Pepper and I'm here. I'm not an abductee, but I have experienced a great deal of uh, mind control and other kinds of methods, tortures, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual, from starting with the ordinary security services in this country and now I believe that happening in conjunction with aliens such as draconians and it has progressed over a five year period. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for coming up from uh, Reading. Give us a little hello and intro again for people who don't know you. My name's Jeff Scott. Since a very early age, I've had interactions with what I think are various ET races, interdimensional races. In the last 11, 12 years, I've had severe harassment from the security services of this country and other countries. I've been injected with a tracking chip, uh, blinded with directed energy weapons, harassed, assaulted. Those are just some of the things I can consciously remember. There's a lot of things that have probably gone on which I have no conscious recollection of. I'm just trying to meet other people on the same sort of wavelength and try and find some answers and basically try to get the truth out about what's being withheld from us. We also have a speaker here who's uh, going to be at our conference for us. This is uh, Young Hei and Young, tell us a little bit about your field of research. Hi, uh, my name is Young, Young Hei Chi. I, I live in Oxford. I'm not an experiencer or doctor, but uh, I'm looking at uh, this phenomenon from a kind of purely academic point of view. Who is doing this? For what? And who are many involved? And what the consequence is? So I'm very happy to, to meet people like you today. Can you tell um, us a little bit, uh, Young, just at the moment, about the, the book that you're working on and also the, the subject matter? I became interested in this uh, topic from about five years ago and I began to see some link between this abduction pheno phenomenon and the environmental crisis. So I presumed there must be some kind of positive relationship and why the abduction cases are increasing as we have more and more serious uh, economic uh, crisis on this planet. So at the moment I'm looking at 
the relationship between the two and writing a, a book about it. An interesting link as well because I hadn't ever looked at those two issues, that is the environmental crisis being relative to the frequency of alien abduction or abductions, could be my labs or alien and or alien abduction. Yes, I mean the starting point of my research was the abduction uh, was not that frequent before we had this uh, global crisis and I begin to see some kind of correlation between the two and obviously the many abductees were shown some kind of image of the earth being destroyed That's true. Uh, in, in various ways mm -hmm. and if that is a re representation of uh, what is happening or what will be happening in the future then clearly this is worth looking at sure, uh, so yeah. that was the basis of yeah. my uh, okay. interest Lovely. Thank you. Well, I just want to come back to one of our experiences whom we filmed a few times now. And it's uh, Simon Parks, who um, can't be with us today because his daughter got married. But Simon, uh, back in mid-March, had an event where he um, had a, a very serious road traffic accident. And that was precipitated by his car being rammed, deliberately rammed, and caused uh, him and his passenger, who was also a fellow experiencer, to have no more than whiplash and, and some serious shock wounds, at, um, whiplash injuries, but luckily nothing else. And this had also uh, been tried a week before. So this is quite interesting because Simon also is also on Whitby Council as a Labour councillor. CT got in uh, in February. He uh, said that he is has decided to move forward with his experiences and tell the world as he sees it, whatever people's attitude to that is. And whoever it was who set up the accident, they, they weren't successful clearly because... Now what's interesting from that is that suddenly, uh, about a few days, three, four days after the accident, he had a flurry of activity from the press. And he said, well, it's interesting, isn't it, Joanne, because the first one started with Scar the Scarborough Evening Post, I believe it's called, and they tried to vilify him, they tried to ridicule him. This is one of the articles. He was actually out in about uh, even The Independent and The Guardian. It went into the London Metro, The Huffington Post, amongst others. I guess I made a, a quick estimate, and I think there are well over 100,000 people who would have seen the material from those papers, because Simon believes that uh, because it's Mason-led, that's the Freemasons are at the top of the tree in the press, that they were trying to do a discredit job. Well, they, they didn't manage it, and it's- It's quite sense. interesting because we also found ourselves in the paper. We recently, this from about January, we in fact, January, February, March, and April, we were in the press. And the April one, which is an interesting one, we were in the sun. And it's actually not so bad, the article, it's a, just a little one, and it says, CNET, phone us at home. And that's in relation to our offering a, our helpline that people can call us as a first port of call to support. And I must say that from that time on, we had about three or four days where the UK public had a lot of fun with phoning the line. And of course, it was just uh, mainly hoax calls. We had about six very interesting calls from that. But I just wanted to, to say for anybody who does see this and wants to ring, it tends to go to answer machine. The voicemail is picked so up. And BBC we... Three wanted to have some of our experiences go out on a trip to the States to, uh, with a skeptic to convince them. So we're not having that kind of behavior. We're not doing that. We're very happy to talk to anybody and we're happy to be a portal for other people and other researchers to, to talk to experiences, but only from moral and ethical point of view. We're certainly not here to be a sideshow for anybody. This is about truth. It's about getting the truth out there. So I was very interested to hear about Jeff again, talking about the harassment that he's had and Joseph's story. And I would really like to go back to Joseph. How things began, Joseph, when things began, what perhaps you think precipitated them and, and also um, perhaps a little bit for, for the very beginning from childhood. Um, there's been a very uh, specific period, five years from two, March 2007, when I took a job at a place called Why Boston Lakes and because I was f much more open psychically then, I realised quite quickly, although this isn't just a golf course and a conference centre, that actually MI5 were based there and were training agents. And that precipitated much more serious activity against me, following me, then putting some kind of circuit in my home and cameras in my home that they could interact with me, preventing me from sleeping. I was then followed by light aircraft which fired at me. I've been, the injuries on my body are multiple but very much specifically in my right knee. They appear to, 
to really dislike the fact that I regularly went out into the countryside and seemed to think that I was meeting with people or doing something. Do you know why you would have been targeted? What it is about you, your life or your abilities that would have made you a target? I'm not absolutely certain, but I think that my life has, is not, has fit any category where you can tick all the boxes of mortgage, children, marriage, husband, that kind of thing. I live on my own and had this pattern of going out to the countryside, visiting churches, and also that when they, often when they followed me by agents or tried to, I would be somewhere where they would, someone would appear just to start a conversation with me and they would actually, I would instantly know that they were an agent. So that would have aroused curiosity. How could I know that someone just appearing to be a stranger having a conversation was actually an agent? Yes, I know other people, I think Jeff's had that as well. And, and perhaps you're not sure why this would have been um, initiated, from what point? Do you have, for example, specific uh, abilities that you're aware of that would have would be of interest? Well it's more in hindsight. I went overland to India in, in 1970 and I ended up with a guru for over a year, a, a really seriously enlightened person, very very powerful. He taught me, I learned things or maybe he just um, made me remember or unconsciously remember and I was subsequently told much more recently that he actually packed me off, that I would have been teaching people a lot, but I did, wasn't really conscious of, of it and hid myself away. I just felt um, very different from everyone else. Um, one thing I would say about when I started working at Y Boston Lakes is that it coincided with me reading Eckhart Tolle's book and becoming aware of uh, space, what he'd call space consciousness. And I used to walk in the grounds there, becoming conscious of space consciousness, where again that is something that most people don't do. And in fact I was walking once in the city of London doing that and a man, just a sort of workman, came up and started all this ridicule abuse at me because he thought I was insane. By looking, by being aware of the space, I was in a totally different space. I'm just going to continue um, with Joseph's story for a moment because it's the anomalous mind management element and doesn't often get referenced, but it is an important aspect of what people, some people go through. And so we really need to explore this a little bit more and see how it's really impacting on people's lives. And in this case, it's Joseph. And Joseph has been talking about how um, in certain work situations that she has been aware of being approached by strangers who are striking up conversations. And that certainly has been part of uh, a process that I've heard before with experiences. I think I was asking you about your, your childhood. Was there anything different or special? I, I remember in our previous chat, we were just saying that you were like the odd one out in the in the family. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, about that and if there was anything and might factor into what's going on for you now. Yes, I, I was very much isolated in my family. They almost seemed to want to ignore me. And I have been told recently that they, they were alien abductees themselves. Um, maybe in this life, this life, when they were alive, and they had also lived on a planet where uh, there was very little emotion. So I was very isolated as a child, which has co continued through my whole life. I think that's one reason, very strong factor, of why I can be easily targeted by them now. In hindsight, I had a lot of spiritual experiences in my childhood, and I believe that I came, was born with a lot of light within me, what I call term, having a lot of light within me. Just simple, very simple things I remember thinking, why are there apples and pears? Why are there sheep and goats? That's because that's a representation of a, a different consciousness, mind consciousness. No, I didn't have anyone to discuss that with, but I, that reflects to me that I knew more than the people around me. So we're just talking to Jeff, and Jeff was really corroborating what Josa has been saying about the um, interactions with these uh, agencies like MI5 and some of the military. So Jeff, please. Uh, since a uh, very early age, I've lived with psychic abilities. Uh, my mother was an extremely psychic individual. I've experienced telepathy all my life, uh, premonitions. Uh, when it comes to my surveillance, uh, these surveillance personnel would come in close to me in, in either a bar or in a close setting in a shop. I would know exactly which ones were the surveillance personnel and quite often I used to compromise them, I used to go up to them and tell them exactly who they were and it used to shock a few of them. I probably got it wrong on a couple of occasions but 
95% of the time yeah. I used to know exactly who was there for my surveillance. Because that question that people have, how do you know it's surveillance people as, as opposed to just an innocent bystander striking up a conversation? I used to always wonder uh, how I always knew which ones were. That's become clear to me now when I've started to learn things about telepathic abilities in people. This seems to be something that experiences and express quite a lot, this uh, telepathy, this empathetic uh, aspect, yeah. how, you, how yeah. you could know uh, telepathically, you know, and the, you were getting information perhaps from, from the field, we might call it. It came as a natural yeah. ability to me. I used to run rings around uh, the surveillance personnel and they used to come after me in cars if I was driving a car, I used to play games with them. They, they really didn't like that and yeah, they used, to, they used to be quite hostile towards me. Well, what do you think of, the, the point of their contact with you was, Jeff? Well, the overall... Yes, I mean, why do you think that they were surveilling you? It started out, I rustled some of their secret facilities out in ah, out the right. woods, uh, yeah. north of Reading, an area, Christmas Common, is riddled full of secret facilities. Uh, junction 6 of the M40, there's something which looks like a, like a water reservoir, but my friend grew up around there, and that, that is a secret command bunker. Okay. It's an underground facility. It's so the fact that there. you you perhaps touched base, you knew you knew about those, do you think that was enough to trigger them to...? It goes deeper than that. In the last five years since my awakening, I've come to the re realisation that I think my consci consciousness, its original origins, are reptilian. Unlike the reptilians that are running the planet that we hear of, like in books. So the negative aspect. The negative aspects. I come from the opposite end of the spectrum. I feel my origins, uh, what feels most familiar to me is the star system of the Pleiades. Uh, this feels extremely familiar, like an old shoe. I think that's where my spiritual soul es essence originates. I naturally feel abilities, like a, I have a militaristic intelligence based outlook on life. I think that comes from, that's how my reptilian consciousness manifests itself, 3D reality. Yeah, so w when it comes to my surveillance, it was like a game. Eventually I'd get bored and I'd have to go to work, but yeah, it was full <laughs> on and they didn't like me rumbling them. I okay. went up to them and told them exactly who they were and where they, mm. why they were there. Right. They didn't like that and yeah. they used to get quite hostile. So I've, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of harassment, I've been assaulted. Uh, from behind I was knocked out by uh, some military personnel who picked me up off the floor afterwards and then made mention of a phone call, something I'd said in a phone call oh, the, okay. the night before. I've, I've Can woke you remember up. What, you, what it was that you said in that phone call? Eventually. What it was, a uh, friend of mine, Christina, she was going to a festival in Aldershot, of all places. Uh -huh. That's where I was born, it's a military town. Interesting. And mm -hmm. this was at the height of my surveillance. So I'd, said to her thanks but no thanks I, I won't be joining you uh, I met, made mention of it being Squatty Town I'd come out of a bar one night I always check to see who's around me there was no one around me I got about 200 yards down the road and someone come up behind me and punched me in the temple picked me up off the floor it knocked me out so that for the cameras it looked like we were friends he had his arm oh, around right. me and my arm was around his waist I said to him what the hell did you do that for? He made mention to what I'd said on the phone the night before and then he sort of shepherd me, shepherded me towards a taxi and then skedaddled. Okay. did report it as an assault uh, to the police but even though the place was riddled with cameras they could find no record of anything happening like that. I have woke up with three and a half millimetre square neatly cut out of my finger I think you call it a punch biopsy. Oh, I woke okay. up covered in blood and dirt I don't remember how long ago was that, Jeff? Last year, okay. yeah, it was 11 March, April-ish. Oh, right, I was just wondering if that was before or after our interview. It was before that. Before that. But after that time, I had a massive black bruise on my arm that was almost four inches across. Wow. And yeah. in the middle was a huge lump. And I didn't know what, how it happened. And my yeah. friend actually said to me, he said, how did you get that beautiful bruise on your arm? I said, I don't know. And I really, really don't know. Not sure what the lump was in the middle of it. I've never had a lump in the middle of a bruise before. I get a lot of things that happen to me and I just don't know how they've occurred. Clearly, would you say um, then that there, there is a, a high degree of military interest in yourself? It's an extremely 
yeah. high degree of yeah. military interest. So when we have that, I think they, as you were saying, they they like to know what's going on. Right. And mm. yeah, if they can't find out by easy means by bugging mm. your phone, then they'll yeah. use more pervasive means and start mm. to be particularly hostile towards you yeah. in the surveillance. Okay, well, thanks for that, Jeff, and I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to you, but I'd really like to bring in uh, Maria at this um, point. If, uh, well, we can... about my background, well, I'm gypsy, and a lot of people think that gypsies are psychic. I, I don't think that I am, but maybe I am. <laughs> um, what, what about my background about this psychic ability is that I can uh, feel other people, uh, and even trees, uh, their pain mainly, or maybe oh. because there is much pain, and... Uh, as I'm working with children, I can feel even children, which is not also nice. Uh, there is too much of pain in people and everywhere around us. Um, my experience with ETs are uh, mainly in dreams. I had one dream where, where I met, where I was on a spaceship. It was a small spaceship. I think it was here in the UK, or at least according to buildings. I was talking to a, a something like brown or gray. Gray. It looked to me like a robot. Um, he asked me something and I answered, yes, uh, I, will, I will do that because that's for a good thing. But I don't know <laughs> what was that. And then I heard a noise. Um, there was a screaming a woman and I stood up. I was, standing, uh, I was sitting on a table. Everything was, was clean and, and white in that spaceship. And I stand up and I went to check what's happening. Um, and on the other room, there was a woman standing uh, with her back to me. She was screaming, holding her hands on her face. And I saw another table and there were two blue greys standing on each side. And I asked the one what's happening and he didn't say anything. He just, he just looked and waited till she stops and whether she will stop. And then she moved a little bit farther to me. She looked at me very quickly. And the first thought I had was that uh, she doesn't even notice that I am a human. <laughs> which was yeah, quite weird. And then uh, the other small white grey came and ho was holding injections and I knew that he came to um, calm her down. So then I went back to, to other grey, to that one I was previously talking, and I asked him to, to send her back because she's not ready. So and okay. I knew that they did that. The next thing I remember was that I was uh, somehow aware of what's going on and they showed me a map with blue and red dots. Then so this is a map of where? Of what, Maria? Uh, there, was, uh, there was a map of the world, uh, North and South America, which was flooded with red dots and then other part of the globe like Europe, Africa and Asia with blue dots. And uh, it, I, I knew like what's happening. So I knew that there, there is like uh, groups, there are two groups. Uh, one is taking care of the uh, America and the other one of the rest. So what's the significance of the red and the blue dots? What, um, what does that mean? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. They told me that they are putting some genes into people and these genes in releasing some amino acids and they are tracking these amino acids they, they are putting also some tracking device which is inside the cells uh, and this tracking device turns to blue dot if that particular person is releasing these amino acids when, whether that when that gene is activated um, so when this gene is activated then what is it that activates what is it an ability is it uh, i think it is perception? some kind of ability i think okay. this is definitely for a good thing um okay. i think they, uh, they say that uh, people need to activate it by themselves they just gave them this gene they they are trying to attract it do you call this an upgrading of humanity uh, i think so yeah I, I definitely the, the, but people need to activate it by themselves i don't know how do you know what it is we're activating no. No. And do you know what the difference is between the blue and the red? Uh, the blue ones are those who, who are, have already activated this gene. Oh, okay. And the red ones are those who, who have this gene but it's not activated yet. Oh, okay. And you were saying you noticed the different colours in different parts of the world. Yes. Tell us. Tell uh, there was mainly blue dots in, in Europe as uh, this part, this group is not... Uh, so in Europe then, yeah. it means that there's a lot of people already, if you like, online? Well, uh, th th there were a lot of people. They don't care about America. There's another part of group, so they don't have data from it. So whole America was, was red. So they have just this uh, Europe, but it was 
it was not enough. And what I said, as I was aware, it looks like I'm working with them. And I said, this, need, this needs to be doubled. So we need double the blue numbers in Europe. Yes. yes. So we need to get activating our genes, girls and boys. I don't know what we have to do, but... Uh. Blue or red in the rest of the world, Asia yeah, or Yes, there, were, there was like Europe, Russia. Asia and Africa. Africa um, as well. Yes, yeah. as well. But mainly it was in Europe and Asia as well. And that part of Africa was... Not, not that much, but there was few. Uh, but yeah, there was like Europe and Asia. It's like one half. Who is, who is behind this program of upgrading humanity? Uh, those were blue greys, tall blue greys, um, that are working, I think, with Pleiadians. Okay. Because I had also uh, experiences on mothership in a space um, with Pleiadians and blue greys. I have one more question. When did it happen? How old were you? And where, um, where did it happen? I don't know when and how old I was. Uh, I just, uh, in that dream, I was looking with my eyes, so I didn't see myself. Yeah, but when did you have this dream? Uh, it was last year, somewhere in uh, September, November. Mm. So it seems that this is sort of a work in progress then, and, and you feel that this is very positive? Definitely, it's, it's positive. Okay. And have you had any other experiences? Have your family had any other experiences, or is it um, just you? I don't want to talk about Okay, it. that's absolutely Four therapists. Fine. <laughs> so perhaps how you think your work could specifically help or support uh, our experiences? All right. Well, first of all, I forgot to say which area of the country I come from. I come from Woking in Surrey. I feel my EFT therapy, emotional freedom technique and matrix re-imprinting, will be of most benefit. Now, this is a client-led therapy. It's non-invasive, but it also works very quickly. And I can do it over Skype, so we don't have to personally be in contact. So that's another thing that's advantageous. If anyone is interested at all, please feel free to contact me and we can just talk about it. So Susie, can I just ask you again mm -hmm. why your interest in this field? Well, I've I started researching into this and I'm absolutely fascinated. Many strange things have happened to me throughout my life and as I say, I would not say I'm a contactee, an abductee from a conscious level, but I'm not sure. Um, just thinking about <laughs> ESP, that kind of area. Oh, of, of yes, I am actually a medium. <laughs> oh well, it, it's interesting too because a lot of researchers and, and uh, therapists kind of thing are very empathetic and also mm. have their own their own degree of abilities. But whether you know we our foundations need to be very anchored and, and very very grounded, which perhaps would not be the case if you were an experiencer simply because you're managing constantly the effects of of what you're going through. Yes, I feel very grounded and very balanced and I would say that has come into the fore mainly over the past two or three years. Yes. How can I say? I really live by my gut more than anything, you know. Yeah, um, so intuitive rational. element. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that, um, that again definitely. is... And I feel it's synchronicity, manifestation is happening quicker and quicker. Do you think um, the therapies that you mentioned would be suitable for something along the lines of post-traumatic stress syndrome? Absolutely. Right. EFT is very well known for that. That's great because I know that there are quite a few people coming through and whilst they can do EFT for themselves and there's plenty of free material out there, sometimes I think we just need to, to have uh, another another being to interact with to yes, support us. It is useful when something's extremely traumatic mm. to have a professional person with you because they won't be able to continue doing what they need to in the EFT if they get very upset or something. Yeah. And we can take over from them. Right. Easily. Perhaps you'll feed back to us if there's anything that comes from that because again sharing the information about yes, the success or not or how, how therapies are for people yes. would be very interesting. Yes, very interesting. I'd just like to say that since the conference I went to uh, uh, in Prague, the Exopolitics Conference on the 12th and 13th of May, 
Amash has been invited to be an advisor on the board of the Exopolitics Institute. So that's bringing us into a whole new field uh, and a whole new well, area. Well, yeah. Scientists, people like, I think it's William Brown who's out in, in Hawaii, who's a very interesting scientist on the biomolecular side of things. Definitely it's worth having a look at that. They're looking at whether they can see in the DNA the alien interaction, how that uh, manifests in the DNA as well. So there's a lot of very interesting material out there and so we look forward to our continuing relationship with that. We'd like to have autonomous groups and I know there are groups who meet from time to time. If there is anyone who wants to set up a group in their locale or just represent a MASH as a, as a group that you can be a point of focus and contact then please do let us know we're very happy to support you and if you so Jeff is there has there anything been anything else going on for you in the recent past because it's been a little while and yeah, the have. on March the 23rd in the early hours of the morning that's this year I take it this year yeah, yeah I had what I thought was a, a dream there were your common old garden small gray beings and they were working on my back I had two views of this one was over my shoulder uh, the second one was from about eight foot above my body, watching this group of oh. so there about four or five of them, probably two, three in the morning. I've woke up, as usual, in the nightmare scenario, calling out and suddenly took stock of my situation. Thought, ah, just a dream. Gone back to bed. Three days later, I think March 26th, same sort of time, I was sleeping in a double bed in my bedroom. My girlfriend was next to me. I was on the left side of the bed, on my left side. I, th I think I was lying this on my back, and then I've turned onto my left side. All of a sudden, I've, I thought my girlfriend had rolled over and had put her thumb into my kidney and started to press harder and harder and harder. It felt like a, a red-hot wow. poker being put into my kidney with increasing intensity until... I snapped, spun round in less than a second. I put my elbow into my girlfriend's back. Right, uh, obviously, it took less less than a second to spin round from being completely asleep to going into a complete defence move. The last part of that moment seemed to take an eternity. And mm. I woke up and thought, oh my God, it's Joe. I didn't put full pressure onto her. Uh, my elbow just contacted her. And the next day, she just had a very small bruise. I obviously stopped just in time before it caused her any damage. So yeah, there, there was obviously a sore point there somewhere. Uh, have you had back difficulties? Do you think they were doing some healing? No, no, I've never so, had problems. So no I'm problem not sure lower. what it was. So did you have any marks from that? Uh, did not you that I know any? of. Have you noticed any um, fallout from that experience in any way? Nothing at all? No. Okay, no. That's, that's interesting. Nothing further. For two days after it happened, I, I was shocked at the move I pulled. Right. It was not something that was familiar, familiar to me. I've, oh, okay. I grew up in a Hells Angel pub full of bikers. Yes. And you know, no strangers to having fights. <laughs> but it's, it's not something I've ever yeah. used as a self-defense move. But it was quite strange. And for two days afterwards, I thought, what was that all about? Uh, there was obviously something going on. Your guess is as good as mine as yeah. to what. Quite interesting too, because the kidney area is an area where attachments can have can anchor. That is attachments like possessions, entity possession, that kind of thing. And also addictions are locked into the adrenals and the, around that area. So, I mean, not that that's anything, but it's just interesting, isn't it? Because if something is wanting to perhaps to connect, it's your you know a real strong energetic point there, isn't it? At, at the time, yeah. I... I had the feeling there was something just over my shoulder. I actually thought it was Jo. Your girlfriend. Yeah. Was, went to cuddle me. Yes. But it felt like she was putting like a red hot thumb yeah. into my kidney increasingly yeah. hard until I just snapped and spun around yep. to defend yeah. myself. But okay. when I spoke to her the next day, she had her back to me, which yeah. is why she ended up with a small bruise around her kidney okay. area, actually, where yeah. Put my elbow straight into it. Again, we're well, talking like about to... sort of the, the impacts uh, experience are having, experiences are having, and also on the body. And because you again were telling us, Joseph, that you'd had a lot of marks, things on your body, that were as a direct result of some kind of interaction. Yes, I do have a lot of um, injuries on my body, but I would like to say two things to add. Uh, last August, I was woken up in a similar kind of fashion, which is the way often they do it, the very absolute extreme um, cramp in my legs. And I was woken up and then I felt something being fired into my lower back several times. I mean, it was like, 
and someone was saying to me, oh, we shouldn't have had to do this. And ever since that time, I've had terrible difficulties with my back, with um, mo mobility, and because I do yoga, but that, and that ameliorates some of the effects. And the other th thing is, which matches with this, is about, I went through a period very much where the brainwashing techniques were to me, make me very aggressive and I was very extremely worried that I was going to be used, brainwashed into a situation where I would be extremely violent as another way of maybe getting me arrested into the ordinary police system. Because I also, many, many years ago, I know of someone, a Jewish woman who went into the army in Israel and I met her. She went completely insane because I believe very much that um, Mossad brainwashed her to do something and half the other half was in absolute horror at what she had done. Right. So sorry, yes, but I, I yes. really had to, to say those. That, that again, that, that is, is very interesting. I just want, we've got just one or two minutes before we uh, have a little break here, but I'm, I'm still very curious, Josa, and, uh, and I still don't, don't really have the information, and maybe you don't either, about what specifically you think that they're interested in, in you. I know you said you had, you're aware you had a lot of light and that even your parents seem to be afraid of your energy, let's say, your light energy. Do you think this is, do you think your, your, your bio field is sending out some kind of marker or energy that is of interest to military and security services? And if so, why? What, what used to yes, I, I don't, as I say, I think that the guru sent me off and perhaps I was doing something and I didn't realise, but I think I've woken up more. I've had several experiences um, quite recently, in the, in the three years I've been tortured. One was in um, but Lincoln's Inn Fields very recently, where literally I have the trees, the London plane trees, I have this amazing connection with them. And they, either they or they, I was able to see what the veil was torn back and I could see the world as it really is in this absolute Christine, Christine beauty and wonder. And um, maybe they, they, I don't know, but yes, as you say, I don't really know, but maybe it's because I have, they recognized long before I have, that I have had these abilities. And yes, I am sending out a lot of light and they're constantly trying to quash it. Maybe that is the thing. Maybe that is the thing. They're trying to dampen down the light energy. Well, that makes sense. I can I can certainly understand it from that point so of view. You'll, you'll be privy to the wonderful sounds that we're also experiencing, the cockerels and the bird song, and it's absolutely beautiful energy. And uh, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to. And welcome to part two being arched over and looked after by a beautiful beech tree. With um, Maria next, we're going to start with her perhaps first memory of a, of a conscious experience and that was when she was about four. So Maria. I think about four years old and there, um, that was in the night, uh, three, three people appeared to me. They were a human, uh, one woman, one older man and one younger man and they uh, told me that I have been born to stop the war um, and they show me some pictures. Um, and you're saying stop the war? Yeah, stop okay. the war. Okay. And they uh, show me pictures about uh, destruction. Um, I saw explosions, fire, uh, trees were falling down, a lot of water. And how, how did they show you that? Did they, sh did they sort of manifest that image in front of you? As no, it, it was in my head. I, okay. saw, it, I saw it in my head. But then it was so horrible that I asked them to forget it. So mm -hmm. they did it. Uh, I just remember that, that these few pictures, but they showed me a lot of other pictures. Um, and they, they asked me if I, if I will do it, and I said, I, did it, I don't know even what, what, word, uh, what world war really means. Okay, so they're asking you then if you would stop the war. That's yes. what you've come here to do, but you didn't understand at four years old. Yes. yes. <laughs> so the, the, then I... Then I said, like, I'm afraid, so that I ask for, for an angel, because I first thought that there are angels, but I say they are not angels, but I can call them, because I was afraid to talk to them. And they, they gave me some angels, some, some human. Uh, I thought he's angel, so he was taking me later on uh, from the window. Went out from the window with, with Yeah, him? I was flying <laughs> from the window. And did that, do you remember uh, feeling it physically? Um, 
No, or, no, it was no. in your your other body, your astral body. I don't know, oh. <laughs> but it was. I think so. It was just astral body. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and you were also saying that then, about twelve years old, you had another experience when they came to ask you about stopping the war. Oh, yeah, they came again, and uh, as I have talked to my mother, uh, she told me to say no because of the war, and I said that. I said no, and then uh, I almost died. And uh, so, so this almost dying. What happened? What was that I- event? I mean, did you have an accident? Oh uh, yeah, that that was on Easter. Uh, I was eating orange, so <laughs> it was it was it, my orange. So was choking. Stuck. Yeah, I was choking um, mm. with an orange, and uh, I saw a man standing there. He he showed me his hand, and I knew that he is my father. So I so I went to him. And when you say this is your father, we're not talking about your a uh, human father, are we? No, 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 definitely not. But he he is my father. <laughs> What did, what did he look like? He looked like quite like Indian or quite Oriental, maybe Gypsy. I don't know, but that kind of guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did you feel a relationship with well, him? Well, I, I know that he is my father. Yeah. I just know that he is my father. Uh, <laughs> so I just went with him. I, I think I spent somewhere two or three weeks. And I remember that there, wherever I was, I, I said that, uh, okay, I will come back and I will do it. So I, I just came back into my body. I saw my mother, my sister screaming around me and I just came, entered my body, put my hands into my neck, took out orange and that was it. Well, I didn't have uh, any other like uh, okay. destroying pictures, but I had other, like some something about the earth, concerning earth. I was on a, on a spaceship. It was uh, it was really big ship, I think, mother ship. Uh, from that ship, I could even see a uh, shut space shuttle, uh, Earth in mm. the front. Uh, there was a uh, yellow yellow sun on right side, and on left side there was blue sun. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, they were they were having some meetings on that spaceship. There were other beings. Uh, there was that Oriental guy, which I know that he is my father. Then a blue guy with a blue robe uh, with gold ornaments. He was quite uh, important, hierarchically quite high. Mm-hmm. And then other other greys, uh, different sizes and colors. And there was uh, a human, a woman with yellow hair. So they were uh, discussing something what what already happened, and uh, what next, what steps they should take next. So I was uh, uh, as well there. Okay, so you were part of this uh, discussion. Yes. And was this to do with the welfare of the planet or the evolution of our Earth? Yes, yes, uh, there was definitely, they were talking uh, something about w- w- what, what next step they should take, about what what, what concerning the Earth. I don't remember uh, exactly what, but I remember just an idea of it. Okay. It was definitely concerning some Earth, what next step they should take. Okay. And again, you were, you were, you mentioned something about uh, seeing Earth in a different solar system. Uh, yes, tell us yes. A bit about that? That was at the same spaceship. Okay. Um, and uh, there was a woman. Uh, there was a table, a white table, it looked like plastic or so. <laughs> it was very clean and uh, she showed me, um, I think it was hologram or so, there was a universe, there was our solar system. Uh, I could even touch it, I, I feel that I, I, I took the earth out of it and then put it back. Um, and she told me that something like uh, that, that the Mercury will see the sun the first, when it, when it will see the sun, it will go away. Uh, and what will go away? The, so the mercury will, will so mercury go will away. disappear when it sees the sun. What does it mean to see the sun? I don't know. Maybe when the sun will rise up onto it. Uh, okay. But she wasn't talking about our solar sun. It was some other sun. Okay. Uh, I think she was talking to me in simplistic way. Okay. Um, and then when the Venus will see the sun, then it will go farther away. And when the Earth will see the sun then it will go really, really far away and uh, then it appear like um, another universe. So um, you, uh, by that, by saying that it will go away, the Earth will go away, do you mean it will go, it will transcend, it will go into a different solar system yeah, or a different yeah. frequency? Yeah, uh, on, that, on that picture she was showing me, on that hologram, mm-hmm. it, uh, the Earth stood up uh, and there was another universe, uh, another solar system. There were 16 planets in a row, oh, okay. uh, Earth was fifth. And there were other, also other planets, and the sun was blue. Just for a, a comment, Susie, because I, I know, again, um, you're a little bit shy of talking about some of your extraordinary life things. Uh, and you say that there, it's all quite ordinary, but I uh, didn't think that you were quite ordinary, because when you can have <laughs> three times a broken neck yes. and uh, escape death as a four-year-old being dragged from a horse, 
I, you know, you're obviously meant to be here. Okay, well, cutting a long story short, I started doing some research into free energy and anti-gravity, as I mentioned before, and that led on to other areas of research, including medicinal situations that are going on. Um, I learned a lot about the uh, vitamins, minerals, natural substances that all aid our immune system, as well as, um, you know, things like Codex Alimentarius that are trying to take away the nutrients and the vitamins and any good food that we've got that is being removed from our possession one way or another. And there, I've detailed lots and lots of the ways in which they're going about that in the book that I mentioned earlier. So one of the things I'm here to do is now I've actually written the book and I've released the information that was important initially to get out. Now it's more of a, instead of talking about it, do something about it. And that's why I'm trying to help things um, balance out here in order to bring like-minded people together so that they can actually have somewhere to go to talk to people that actually have either experiences or are aware of the potentially dangerous situation that we're all in for the human race. Yeah. And uh, that's what I'm here to do. So um, if there's anybody out there that can bring another piece of the puzzle, I'd love to hear from them. Yes. We also want to put out events such as camping weekends, uh, coppicing, all sorts of things, permaculture, living off the land, producing our own food, aquaponics, hydroponic systems, um, superfoods, all these kinds of positive things as well as So you're knowledge. going to be running courses on that kind yes, of thing? Yes, so not great. me personally, but, yes, the, but the experts the, that can come here and share their knowledge through yeah. um, putting on a weekend course on coppicing or a weekend course on building um, hay houses or yeah. dolmens or anything. Yeah, because in fact there are some um, eco buildings here on the land, aren't there? Indeed, there's yeah. a uh, village at the top of the land uh, that are actually m building wigwams and doing all of the things that I just mentioned. Tell us some of your experiences, Tony, because I know you've had a few yourself <coughs> yep. um, that brings you into this whole sphere of, yeah, of life. Uh, I'll just give you them really briefly. First one I had, I was walking along the seafront in a place called Dor in Dorset. I was looking up at the stars thinking, this is beautiful. And I just went, uh, for some reason, it crossed my mind about y UFOs. And then I went, oh, you know, if they're real, please show me one. And then all of a sudden there was a spotlight. What looked to me like a helicopter spotlight came over a, like a, uh, a fort. Right. As it came over a fort, as it got closer, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about UFOs. I'd said this, put it out and forgot it. And I'm just carrying on walking. Then this, I'm, I'm thinking it's a police helicopter with a light because I can see a halo around it and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, it, it, it was floating. It came over a, about a mile, but it was just like a leaf in the wind. It was just floating, but it was steady. It wasn't blowing around. And then it got sort of like parallel to me and the beach. And I was looking at it going, you know, what the heck's this? And then all of a sudden it started to glow and then just went vertically and shot up completely, instantly, straight out in the atmosphere. And of course, I was absolutely stunned about that. That was just, what the heck just happened? That was one. There was another time over Portland Bill in Dorset where I think there was about seven purple lights all floating over Portland Bill. I actually went into the pub, got about six or seven people, said, come here, look at this. And we were all stood there watching these lights and then all of a sudden they started blinking out one at a time. They were going, oh, it's the RAF playing tricks. And I said, what, purple lights? <laughs> you know, it's like, hang on, no, this is not. Anyway, there's another one as well, sitting down a Sunday evening. I was sitting out in the back. We had a beautiful day at the place where I was living. Had a glass of wine. I just had a shower. I was all clean in my dressing gown. Really beautiful evening. Again, uh, the thing came back again. I'd, I'd, at this point, I'd been doing loads of research, so I wasn't as clued down as I thought, you know, at the time. I put the thought out again, said, I'd love to see one of your ships. And then all of a sudden, probably about 30 seconds later, um, I'm looking out into the garden, there's a big tall tree and then this thing floated out from the back of the tree. Just like 15, 20 miles an hour maximum. Just, and it was, it was probably about, about 60, 70 foot off the ground. Yeah. And it had spinning lights in it and there's all sorts of stuff going on. Again, I went into uh, where my landlord was in the other room. He's an ex-SAS guy and he comes out with a pair of binoculars and he's leaning on the tree. He's going, shit, there's lights going around it, this is happening, that's happening. So, again, it wasn't just me, it's, it's, these things are real, okay? So anyway, um, so various experiences like that, um, those three being the main ones, there was another one, but I can't put my finger on it at the moment. Well, I was just going to say, because one of our experiences that we, who we've interviewed, also in the Weymouth area, the Dorset Weymouth area, 
was saying that he too had done exactly what you had, just put the thought out and suddenly it bid and then it became quite quite a frequent thing for him and there was just um, some occasion when it wasn't uh, requested that it happened and he wasn't at all pleased, found himself saying, I don't, I don't want to go again. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, that means you must have gone before. He said, yeah, I guess it must, but you know what? I don't remember about that. Mm. But he was also the guy who was talking about how in the astral, he was in the astral body, he was aware that something was about to happen. And this being sort of rushed toward him as if it had come from somewhere and was carrying on its gait, you know, its way of walking. So it came at a pace, put him by the, took him by the shoulders, put him up against the wall. He could feel this physically. Mm -hmm. And and he he then said to it, I don't want to, to go. And it was a it was a, a grey looking creature about his height, about five seven five eight, uh, all in black. And uh, it sort of narrowed its his big eyes at him as he as he looked because I don't think again these beings are used to being confronted or challenged or or in any way uh, interacted with in a very conscious way, yeah. you know, by by those who have had experiences. So this is very interesting. I'm finding more and more people are perhaps having that opportunity or, or taking it or remembering it or, or, or both. Mm. And they are having an impact because maybe it is that at this time, humanity is becoming a little bit more able to, ha to, to take control and perhaps manage more the experience. And having consent in these experiences is basically what I, I think should, should be. Uh, and I'm, I'm not mm. for this secrecy. So it's just very interesting that... There are quite a few in that location that have been over the years. I think there was a guy uh, just photographing the beach at one point and then all of a sudden he looked at the photograph later yeah. and what he couldn't see was actually there sitting and, you know, there's, there's lots yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that brings me really to the point. As I said, I, I've done lots and lots of research on anti-gravity, free energy, all these types of things. Yeah. What I learned, every time I learned something new, it shocked me and again and again and again and again because I the level of the technology that is being hidden deliberately from us could free us from all of these constructs. Absolutely. Um, money, energy, anti-gravity, uh, lies in the government, lies in the Vatican, lies in, lies in the parliaments, lies, they're all lies. It's lies everywhere. Yeah. And not just that, they are telling you it's lies. Politics, multiple, you know, bloodsuckers, lies. But it's, it's, it's look at the words, you know, and break the words down, government. Well, what's government? Well, to govern the mental. They see you, see people like us as mental because we're putting up with what they mm. place upon us. Mm. In other words, you've got to have a law for this, a law for that, a law for that. They're building a construct, law by law by law by law, taking away our privacy step by step by step by step. You can't do this because of that. And it's, it, they're building this prison for us to exist in. Now, we are making conscious decisions that are going along with all of this. What we need to do is go, hey, no, we're not putting up with this anymore. We need to become conscious that you're doing it. And therefore, when we are conscious you're doing it, our own consciousness will rise above Again, that. I was yeah. listening to uh, the interview with uh, a lady called Leah Haley, who, who is an American who had lots of experiences of military abductions and um, real terrible abuse uh, and stuff like that. and. It, it was uh, human mainly, but then human and ET and all of the rest of that caper. The uh, distress, to, to speak of it in, in just even that ter tone, it is just outrageous. Completely. Uh, absolutely. And, and so, you know, one of the reasons that Amash is around is, is about talking about this stuff and, uh, sure. you know, giving it airtime and really bring it to people's attention because uh, some of it is difficult. It's not, you know, it's not all bad. It's not all, all terrible. Of course not. But yeah. I do believe by speaking about it more and, and collectively coming together and having these meetings and that kind of thing, help people come to terms with what they're going through as well. And, and uh, you know, I think yeah. that's really a vital thing. That's what I mean. If anybody's listening to this interview and you can make it over to Bodenham in Herefordshire, um, I'd gladly, I'd love to sit down with you and maybe give you a different point of view on why things are happening and how they're happening and how they all fit into the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, absolutely, that's what it's about, doing, do, making some changes on the ground, be the change, just yes. any other yeah. way, just yeah. get in there, say, right, okay, and open up, open up topics, open up conversations, yeah. open up debate about these sort of things and try and, uh, again, raise, raise awareness. Yeah, if we could have and, a, um, another word with Joseph because... 
sort of coming to up to present day, Joe. So I'd be quite interested to know how you find things currently and, and how you're, you know, how are you doing? Are you well? You know, how are you managing things? Well, the torture is 24-7 and, and just now in this circle they've been doing their favourite little trick which is to make me go to sleep and then shot me awake all the time so I wasn't, um, I haven't got narcolepsy or anything like that, it's just a silly little trick they play all the time I'm woken up every night, I could be tortured um, with anything I'm never allowed to sleep through I'm woken up some things like one minute before the alarm goes off, just to say that they are in control, whatever I do they're trying, they've very much more sophisticated things in the last year with memory manipulation, to, um, taking memories away or accessing all my memories so that they can then act as if they're me, trying to um, speak as me in my head. And I'm coming to the conclusion very strongly that I can't trust any thought. It's like that's the spiritual side. I need to be in the present moment all the time and to examine every thought and say, is that me or is, is it not? And to very carefully decide how um, to absorb. It teaches me a lot about how everything is just energy. You mentioned the very strong word uh, of torture. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been through so much stress, it's really caused them sort of post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's what they, they have to live with. What manner does the torture take? Is it that you're always disturbed from sleep, always awoken? It, it ha in what manner is it? Does it come in from a particular source that you know, for example? Is it, does it have a particular feeling or... T perhaps tell us a little bit about that so we can have a better understanding. It, it's so manifold and it's been going on so long. It's, it, I, mean, I suppose that's what they want it to be, as if it's, norm, if it's, as if it's normal to me. Um, my body has changed extremely. I've put on huge amounts of weight because I, it's, almost, it's so difficult. That's one of the th ways they, they seem to be wanting to manipulate me, is to make, change my weight and make me very overweight. So it's difficult to be active because there seems to be a very long, strong theme all the time of uh, trying to prevent me being active and going out into the countryside, whatever they imagine that I've been doing. There is still, I'm still um, fired at in my limbs. A, a very recent, uh, earlier this year, I don't know what I'd done to, uh, I, I talked about my back, which is an extreme injury, because that's another pattern that they cause a very extreme injury, and then they worry it like a scab to keep it there. Right. But How did, what, what so happened to the back? Just As if um, fired into a very strict. Oh, right. But yes, the, the, had, earlier yes, this year, there was right. another severe injury was caused in the bottom of my lung. I, I just, I just turned out the light. Usually they wake me up and do it, but this time, as soon as I turned out the light, something started to bore into my lung here, and then it caused, it's, it's a permanent injury now, and it caused a chest infection at the time, which took a right. long time to go away. Do you have any idea where this is being done from, or how to it? No, I don't know. I don't believe myself personally. I don't believe it's from there because I think it's gone to a much higher level. I, I think they are more like ordinary agents, if you want to say, the, right. in, in quotes commas, they work with humans and they, guess they do things like literally follow people around in cars. I think this is very sophisticated torture from... Because I also was, um, this year, I was woken up and something, because I have a, phys I think it's a physical chip in my right shoulder, but this was something that was inserted into my brain. And I, I, I believe that that could only come from either working with aliens or that it's alien technology. Insert it uh, consciously. Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, a lady uh, who we were talking to recently and she um, had sent off uh, a hair sample to be tested by a chap who apparently is brilliant at this and goes sort of way out of the box in his analysis and uh, he came back to her and he said have you uh, and he, he knows nothing about her except her name and the hair piece so there's no other information and he said are you in a war zone she said no and he said well have you just come back from a war zone uh, she said no and uh, he said, well, he said you um, have radiation damage to the bottom of your brain. She said, well, microwave. He went, yes, how, how did you know? She said, uh, I, I know, I'm, I'm being attacked. She said, I'm, I'm aware of it and they're trying to stop me breathing as well with damage to the lungs.
So I don't know who these covert people are, but and I don't know how they get triggered because certainly the stalking element and what's called gang stalking, which sounds so horrendous, um, I know several people who have experienced that and spoken about it. And I just wonder how the heck the people who do it, who seem to be you know, in the locale of the person who's been targeted, how do they get paid? Who, who is their master? Mm. I just wonder how they're triggered to start doing things because it's, it seems, you know, somebody warned me once, said, Joanne, be careful, you might start finding yourself under attack from random acts. And I said, well, actually, that's quite interesting because my car was randomly attacked earlier this year, which is very interesting because it happened, uh, this, the perpetrator then went on to damage my dad's car and did it twice or three times, I can't remember now, but... It was most, it was bizarre. I mean, this person was clearly a slightly psychotic individual, but whether those people are triggered because they have that baseline ability for psychosis, I don't know. And they are then driven like my, with mind control. I don't know what anybody else thinks, but if you, anybody wants to say anything, let me know and I'll hand over If I may just want, say one thing, I do firmly believe there is an element of just bullying in there and it isn't direct, it is sort right. of just anarchic. Right, okay. Well, that, that's interesting, but I still find it peculiar that, um, it, you know, with the history that you've had of, of ongoing, uh, I assume it's ongoing, is that yes, correct? Yes. Of ongoing, tar being targeted, that nothing is random. Yes, right. yeah. targeted, yeah. Yeah. To control people on a mental level as well as on a physical and emotional and energetic and many, many other different layers. They're just different frequencies. It's, it's as sure. simple as that. They just adjust to a frequency and then they use that particular frequency yeah. for a means. Just the beginning, there's so many different um, energy weapons out there that they're using, including in space. 9-11 at de-atomised the actual um, the buildings themselves. I think um, Dr Judy Wood's work on that is fantastic. Yeah. and uh, Quite interested to say something about uh, oh. anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that just now. Back in 1990, I think it was 90 or 91, we used to drink in a pub in Reading pub used to kick out about 11 o'clock well, everything used to shut down uh, much at that time it was back in the thatcher years you know if she was out at 12 o'clock at night you'd be arrested probably or searched at the very least but yeah we, we left the pub one night there was there was about a group of about 17 of us we traveled about half a mile to a place near the river where there's a play park and we was just hanging out there, there as boys girls just hanging out in the distance i saw what looked like aircraft landing lights of an aircraft approaching but they, they were much bigger bright huge we just watched it uh, as we were talking chatting and it came towards us slowly when it actually got over us it was very low it, it was about less than 5,000 feet I'd say I'm no airman but mm. I know what a thousand foot is and it was probably about three or four less than 5,000 it was a large triangular craft. It, there was a bit of cloud around, but most of the sky was clear. This, this thing was massive. It was football pitch size. It wasn't making any sound apart from the air it was displacing as it came through. We watched it go over the, our heads, all of us, and slowly go in a dead straight line off towards Greenham Common, where the Americans used to have their, all their nuclear bombs based. And recently, since I've heard the Barry King material, I made the connection. I thought that craft was going in that direction. It was towards Berkshire. But the thing is, it, it had landing lights on. It was massive and it was low on basically a clear night. So it was meant to be seen, I think, for some unknown reason. Yeah. I don't understand why. It Maybe. wasn't powered by mm. normal uh, means like jet engines. So when I hear people speak about the secret space program and anti-gravity... I know things exist because I've seen it with my very own eyes, along with about 17 other people. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of secrets that are kept from mankind, all the energy, the anti-gravity. Types of craft and what powers them and all that. TR3B. Well, I have had a look at some of those, and they they seem to have one big light on each corner, and I've. Mm. Heard a lot of interviews with people that have actually seen those craft, the TR3B, and seen them hovering and yeah. flying about. It, it didn't seem to be the same, and I haven't, in all my research, I haven't seen anything that matches what I've seen. I've, I could draw a picture of it. We had a large red panel on the underside of it, a big rectangular panel, mm. 
and on the back of it as it was going away it was going too slow for its height and size to be powered by conventional means on the back of it it just had a another huge rectangular dark red panel and it had a sculptured bodywork under the on the underside and the lights were at the front of it they were huge and they were kind of behind the lights was sculptured back and on each wingtip it had a small white light now, I've never seen anything probably in all my research that matches it since sort of thing so probably just a newer model you've got a lot of these things out there's pyramids been floating around recently in Russia and various mm. other places if you're aware yes, or not yeah. Can I, can I just uh, are these humans uh, UFO or aliens UFO? And I think those t with the TR3Bs in general are human UFOs, with, probably using alien technology. With alien technology but in collaboration with probably yeah. the, the small greys or whatever ones have give mm -hmm. the technology to the governments lots, back in the day. Lots of different races are involved in this program. Um, I, the way I see this is the human race coming to its pinnacle as a conscious being being consciously aware of what we've lived in previously and have a different perspective on it now instead of being in it we can look above it and get above it and, and look at it look at it from a different angle um you know we know we know vaccines are dangerous we know they're piling fluoride in the water and we know the pesticides are in the food okay we've done that we've got that guys now we need to put the pieces together and understand why and that's, that's the point where we just leap into a different perspective and that's the consciousness leap that I'm talking about. It's right, got it. So why were you doing it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Connect it together. Right, I understand it now. Got it. And that's the point. I do you know why the humans are using this UFO? To get around to travel, but I mean, you know, that's just one tiny, tiny piece of it. The point is they have all this technology that they're keeping away from us and they're doing the opposite to us. We're getting poorer and poorer and poorer, weaker and weaker and weaker, and they're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at us to keep us dumbed down and shut down. And no, it's not working. They know it's not working. Plus, the galactic alignments are all in our favor as well with the highest, higher densities. Um, everything all together is, is just, we're, we're massively leaping ahead, and they're trying to s slow us down. Chemtrails, again, yeah. geoengineering of the atmosphere. It's just throwing everything Absolutely. in the kitchen sink at us. It's not going to work. But I'd like to um, ask Young if he has any thoughts about what he's heard this afternoon, having chatted with people. And, the problem um, for me is to is how to establish um, Maria's, in terms of Maria's expression, uh, experience. Uh, to what extent this is real and to what extent this is kind of dream the fantasy. There is no, it seems to me, there is no objective kind of criteria by which we can tell uh, yeah, the extent true. to which really uh, you are dreaming for example when you are shown the image of you know uh, the earth uh, the, you know explosion and for is falling down this kind of thing this is the one of the the most serious problems the researchers, researchers like me face and whether the experience was experienced during a kind of dream or in an altered state of consciousness, because you s it seems uh, you were too young at the time, and there was no way to tell uh, in what kind of uh, conscious uh, you know, s state uh, this was happening, really. Do you have any idea about that? Well, I think that uh, when I met them, when I was four years old, I think it was very real, it was very conscious, like now. Uh, but other times it was in my dreams, so I think it could be sometimes physical and sometimes uh, I think more astrally. Uh, I can feel the difference in those dreams that sometimes I feel very light, uh, like I think it just my soul or so. And sometimes I'm very physical. When I'm physical there, I'm not aware of what's going on and, and they are explaining me things. And when I'm uh, astrally there, I know what's going on. So that's the way, how can I say the difference? I think also that, Young, many, many people, experiences have seen this uh, image, for example, of the Earth. So you, know, you could ask really every single one that, but it's a very common theme, yes. very, very common. So, which, you know, must lead us to think that there is more than 
um, chance or coincidence about this and that it, it has a real message for us whatever form of consciousness we're in and that you know we need to pay heed to that and I think this is again our problem where very much in the analytical mind and yes we do need uh, rationalization of course but we we override the heart the gut the intuitive uh, instinct and that i think is what needs marrying up much more with the intellectual angle uh, to bring in the balance and i think that perhaps we're coming to that point but certainly i'm a very pragmatic kind of person and i uh, as much as the next person want to see evidence but we do have to allow for this extra element this not this other aspect of our being in, the, in, in my view and we have to give it as much weight as we do the intellect if not more when you think that the heart puts out something like 60 times more energy than the brain which is scientifically documented or proven or that must give us a clue about what we need to pay some attention to and maybe help us orientate our you know how we perceive things take that into account a little bit more people need to realize that if we've got anti-gravity and we've got free energy because you can't separate the two once no. you understand the concept okay let's say all right we, it's all right we've got oil and then we've got gas and we've got all of these different power source, sources but one of the things that we need to wake up to fast and I mean fast, is the fact that nuclear energy is dangerous to the entire, to life in general, Absolutely. to life the worldwide. And we also need to wake up to the fact that people like Professor Chris Busby, Micho Kako, have all talked about the dangers of atomic, um, not necessarily weapons, because you've been fooled on that as well. We don't need nuclear energy. And then when you look at how they've built the plants, where they've built the plants, the fact is they've been built them on fault lines, Yes, that's an interesting one, isn't it? They've stored spent fuel on top of the actual atomic chambers, mm. so that if anything goes wrong, and, and it can easily go wrong, the actual spent fuel can fall into the reactor and create... The potential here is to wipe out pretty much life on Earth if all these go up. So we're on a, in a human race against time to be aware of these things and to act quickly before they start setting these things off yeah. because that's why we've got nuclear energy, I'm afraid. It's yeah. not the fact that, oh, we're hiding the, the, the free energy, it's the fact we want you to have that and there's a reason why they want you to have that. So we've got to seriously, quickly get conscious of the fact nuclear is bad and we don't need it, it's, it's negative, it's going to hurt us unless we remove ourselves it's and come old. out with the free energy. So right, that, that's it, mm. time's out, you know, you're leading us down the garden path, uh, prime ministers, politicians, all mm. the rest of it, mm. Mm -mm. and they're leading us straight into a hell of our own making, basically. We could make this heaven on earth or hell on earth, and it's our decisions collectively that that's are going right. to make that the end yeah. result, and that's what they're trying to warn us of. That's why they're showing us these images. Wake up time. We've got to seriously sort this one out now. Yeah. Joseph? Yes. Um, it may sound, the mic a little bit. It first. may sound simplistic because, of course, I'm learning all the time, but I very uh, encourage everyone to visualize the new all the time because then we are calling that into existence and putting light out there. That, to me, is very important, as well as acting as much as possible not just visualizing because it, we as humans we have to act on what we visualize yeah. but constantly don't allow those negative energies constantly put light in and visualize the new mm. love them and learn from them they're yeah. lessons in life yeah. so okay we understand now let's move on to the next one and the next one and the next one put them all in perspective don't be fearful of them all you've learned your lesson now move on and that's the point i would like to say that i would like everyone to become aware and the one way to do that is to do your own research and look into things as tony was saying that time is moving on very quickly and we really do need to lift our energy up in this world and our consciousness up it is extremely important to mm. do so Totally. So please, please look into it. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. And I'd also just like to just flag up the uh, Olympics are upon us shortly. <laughs> the Illuminati cards would have us uh, believe that there is going to be a combined terrible disaster involving London and uh, who, who knows wherever. 
and uh, there was recently a Japanese video put out, um, I believe, which also goes along the same theme of destruction. So the seeds are being really sown for August 11th, 12th, and you know what? We're not having it. That's right. There's we say no to destruction and yes to life. So let's again uh, emulate what Josie Josa has said uh, and just allow those images to come across our mind's eye and to let them go in light and to put no energy to them at all. Certainly not fear. They're just playing the game, but so are we. Now we're players, we can be consciously part of this. And I think that's where it gets exciting and where we can really impact you know, our own lives as well as uh, those of others by just simply showing our light and sharing our love. Which and manifest great. the future that we really can have. Yeah, which is absolutely. Travelling the stars and learning about all the stuff that's been hidden from us. Absolutely. absolutely. I'd like to just say, I liked at the end of your Amash uh, 04 report, basically saying the cat is out of the bag. Certain governments are just making themselves look silly with their continued hiding of what's going on. Uh, I think they need to come clean with us and let everyone know the truth. Yeah, thanks. So that's a, a hello and goodbye from all of us here at Bodenham Manor. So thanks, Ray. We'll have a look around uh, Bodenham Manor, courtesy of Tony and yourself shortly. And Take we'll care. Goodbye from Bodenham. Bye. Good livestock. <laughs>